Well, it is the day one wrap up at TCT 2015 here in San Francisco for On the Scene. With me is Deepak Bhatt. Deepak and I have uh, done a number of these wrap ups before and now we're at TCT 2015. Deepak, two important major sort of concepts. Radial versus femoral, once again, here we are again. Let's talk about that to start with. That's a quick and dirty and easy one. Right, the DRAGON trial. And I must say, I love that acronym, DRAGON. I always wanted to do a trial called DRAGON. And this was a study of radial versus femoral, a two to one randomization, a more radial than femoral, uh, that overall showed no difference in MACE. Uh, and interestingly, didn't show a difference in bleeding either. No, and candidly, when you looked at the trial carefully though, there was some peculiarity about the randomization. Fewer women got femorals than men. Yeah, there was a gender say. imbalance. No, in, I, I'm in sorry, the, fewer women got the other way, radials right, than men. Which I'm not sure how that actually happened yeah. in a large randomized trial, yeah. but at any rate, it happened, and uh, when they adjusted for that, the results changed a bit. Uh, in terms of the bleeding, but yeah. I think that the results for MACE are concordant with other work, showing no difference in MACE in overall trials. Uh, but for the bleeding, it is a little bit different. Yeah, well, you know, when I think about it, major bleeding, which really is retroperitoneal bleeding more than anything else, the GI bleeds have nothing to do with how you do the procedure. That's right? true. And little femoral hematomas don't really count. So the only thing we're really working on is the whole issue of whether or not a retroperitoneal bleed makes that much difference in terms of how you go about doing the procedure. Right. I'm a femoral guy, as you know, and uh, even though I've done some radios lately and the patients love it, and I think that's an important point. If you're doing sure. something where you want to get the patients out of the hospital, want to have a lot of patient support, a radial is a way to go. Yeah, I think for stable CAD, if you've got a patient that's a same-day discharge candidate, they don't live too far away, radial is terrific. You know, for an ACS patient, you're going to keep them in-house anyway. Uh, but interestingly, other studies have shown that that's really the patient where radial seems to shine, in particular STEMI. I know. We'll have to see about how all that plays out, but Agreed. whatever. Let's move on. Bioabsorbable stents, the absorbed trials, we have trials from China, et cetera, but the absorbed trials are really the central issue here. Absorb three now, three years out. This is a bioabsorbable stent versus science for non-inferiority, and the results are really pretty good. They still continue to show non-inferiority. Thoughts about this bioabsorbable stent business? Sure. So as you mentioned, there was a lot of different studies presented from the Absorb program, but in particular, Absorb three, I thought uh, was you know the most interesting because it was the largest and showed non-inferiority of this new uh, bioabsorbable stent versus an everolimus looting stent, the Zion stent, which you know the data for that are actually terrific and non-inferiority against it's pretty good. Uh, the only sort of uh, issues were less deliverability, so less uh, by about 5% or so, less device success uh, with this generation of bioresorbable stent. And it's a little bulky and a little bit difficult to deliver, but hopefully that'll get better with time. And uh, also not statistically significant, but uh, numerically there was more stent thrombosis. Well, I'm not surprised, are you? Because the stent thrombosis business really has to do more with apposition, and these things are just more difficult to oppose. I mean, this is not rocket science, right? Yeah. The thing that is really interesting for me anyway, as I talk to my patients is, what about the long-term antiplatelets? And you still need antiplatelets for the bioabsorbable stents because there is some late thrombosis. That's right, so, and they don't absorb just like that. I mean, it, it takes some while to get resorbed. So at least in this trial, patients were on a similar degree of DAP out to a year. Yeah, and Deepak and I were talking just before we started this wrap up about so what, the so what effect here. Does it really make a difference for a bioabsorbable stent to be used? They're bulky, they're a little bit more difficult, much more expensive, and yet at one year you're still on antiplatelets, and unless something happens in the long term to tell us whether or not the good old-fashioned drug-eluting stents are not doing well, you sort of wonder whether or not this is going to be a reasonable thing to do, although the bioabsorbable guys, uh, Patrick Sorois and Bernard Chevalier say, this is the way everyone's going to go. What do you think? Well, I don't know. I'm keeping an open mind. I mean, I think the theory of uh, a biosurable stent is, is terrific, and the idea of not leaving something behind permanently, I like it. It makes intuitive sense. You can get an MR if you want. Don't have to worry about vasodilation, vasomotor issues. But, you know, th those are all theoretical benefits right now, so I think we have to wait and see what the long-term outcomes are. You know, certainly it's an intriguing potential new era in stenting if all of this uh, really pans out, but without the longer-term data, 
data, I don't know what we've got yet. Yeah. We'll just have to wait and see. So there you have it, two major topics here on the first day of TCT 2015. Thanks, Deepak. Thank you.